tight semicircle around Grandpa Will. He was sitting in the big overstuffed chair in front of the TV set, waving his fist and screaming at the screen. Across the screen marched old photos of Nazi concentration camp victims, corpses stacked like cordwood and dead-eyed survivors. As the horrible pictures flashed by, a dark voice announced the role of camps, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, Hremlo, Dachau. Give them this, Grandpa Will shouted at the TV, holding up his left arm to the set. The sleeve of his shirt was rolled up above the elbow. The photograph of a Nazi colonel standing sharply at attention flashed by. I'll give them this. Aunt Ava was shaking her head as Uncle Sam snapped off the TV set. Then she murmured, please forgive him, please. It was the war. Her voice was as soft as a prayer. Hannah sighed. He's starting again, she whispered to Aaron. Aaron shrugged. Hannah could scarcely remember when Grandpa Will didn't have these strange fits, showing off the tattoo on his left arm and screaming in both English and Yiddish. When she'd been younger, the five-digit number on his arm had fascinated her. It was a dark blue, very much like a stain. The skin around it had gotten old, but the number had not. Right after Aaron's birth at his brie party, when all the relatives had been making fools of themselves over him, Hannah had taken a ballpoint pen and written a string of numbers on the inside of her own left arm, hard enough to almost break the skin. She had thought that it might please Grandpa Will as much as the new baby had. For a moment, he'd stared at her uncomprehendingly. Then suddenly he'd grabbed at her, screaming in Yiddish over and over, his face gray and horrible. Everyone at the party had watched them. It had taken her father and Aunt Ava a long, long time to calm him down. Even though they tried to explain to her what had upset Grandpa Will so, Hannah had never quite forgiven him. It took two days of hard scrubbing before the pen marks were gone. She still occasionally dreamed of his distorted face and the guttural screams. Strangely though, she'd never dared ask what the words meant. In her dreams, she seemed to know. No one had ever volunteered to tell her. It was as if they'd all forgotten the incident, but Hannah had not. Mama, Hannah said when the TV was turned off and calm restored at last to the room. Why does he bother with it? It's all in the past. There aren't any concentration camps now. Why bring it up? It's embarrassing. I don't want any of my friends to meet him. What if he shouts at them or does something else crazy? Grandpa Dan doesn't shout at the TV or talk about the war like that. Grandpa Dan wasn't in the camps, thank God. He was born in America, just like you. That's because my family came over to this country in the early 1900s, second class, not steerage. She got that faraway look that signaled she was about to recite another part of the family saga. Hannah knew there was only one escape. I think I'll help Aunt Ava in the kitchen, she said quickly, and ran from the room before her mother could continue. Although it was Grandma Belle's place to light the candles in her own home, over the years it had become a family tradition to let Aunt Ava do it, compensation for her not having a house or family of her own. Aunt Ava could have been married, not once, but three different times, even though, as Hannah's mother pointed, had pointed out, she was no great beauty. But Aunt Ava had preferred living with her brother Will and his wife and helping them raise Hannah's father when Belle was away at work. Why did she do it? Hannah had often asked. Because she wanted to, was the only answer her father had ever given. Maybe she likes kids, Rosemary suggested once. Maybe she likes cleaning house. I have an aunt like that. And what does she do? Hannah had asked. She's a nun. Don't be a jerk. Jews don't become nuns. So they live with their brother and take care of his kids. His kid, Hannah said. My father's an only child. But none of the answers satisfied Hannah's need for romance and a perfect story. Still, she eventually stopped asking the questions. And the only issues she ever brought up with Aunt Ava herself had to do with everyday things, like how many teaspoons of sugar went into a glass of iced tea, or what took a stain out of a leather skirt. 
or how to knit a scarf or make potato soup or where to find a pair of old fashioned shoes for the school play. Aunt Ava had always had the answers to these sorts of things. When Hannah had been younger, Aunt Ava's answers had seemed magical. But as Hannah got older, the magic disappeared, leaving Aunt Ava a very ordinary person. Hannah hated that it was so, so she pushed the thought away. Still, when Aunt Ava lit the holiday candles, broad hands encircling the light, her plain face with its deep set coffee colored eyes took on a kind of beauty. The flickering flame made her look almost young. Watching Aunt Ava saying the prayers over the candles was the one moment in all the family gatherings that Hannah had always found special. It was as if she and her aunt shared a particular bond at those times, as if the magic was still somehow alive. A yasaret for all the beloved dead, a grace for all the beloved living, Aunt Ava always whispered to Hannah before reciting the Hebrew prayers. Hannah whispered alongside, along with her. Even Aaron, Aaron tried to get in on the act, but he mumbled the words a full beat behind. Annoyed, Hannah poked him in the side, but he shifted away. In frustration, she caught up the fleshy part of his upper arm between her fingers and pinched. He cried out, Hannah, her father said sharply. Hannah felt her face grow red and she looked down at her plate.